great, great uh, time today. And uh, my thanks to all of you who are veterans and all of you family members as well uh, in these days that uh, have family members who serve faithfully. Uh, and as we uh, thank you and think about, um, we thought about America and our singing, you just remember that everything America has been, will ever be, is all due to God himself, and without him it's nothing. I mean, that's just it. He's given us the ability to sacrifice and to do all the things we do, and everything that we have comes from him, and we praise God for that. And uh, thank you for being here today, really do. Um, in uh, 1921, the nation called Ukraine was taken over. They were very independent people, especially in the West, very proud of their language, proud of the country. But in 1921, 2021, they were taken over by Stalin uh, and uh, Russia. And his goal when he took it over was to make it a socialist utopia the model for everybody of what socialism really looks like. And he started out and he's got on, he thought, man, this is not working. And so he decided he had to put a little force on it. And so he began to take away all the farms of the people in Ukraine and uh, they didn't have any land. He took it away from them and did some other things. And when that wasn't going uh, the way that he might've thought it would in 1932, uh, he began to starve the people to death because now he owned everything. And during, in 1932, 13% of the Ukrainian population died of hunger. And you're talking about a place that was the, is, has been and still is somewhat the breadbasket of, of the world. He starved them to death. I mean, people would be walking down the street and just fall over in a ditch. And he was trying to get their attention. If you want to eat, you do what I say. It was a very troubling time. Of course, if you know much about Stalin, you know he was evil anyway. But reality is that in 1941, Germany came in. They went from one kind of thing to 1941, Germany came in. Germany came in, made sure they couldn't fight them back by taking anything that might be a weapon, and they burned the churches and... Uh, tried to stamp out any references of God uh, in that. I heard one man give a testimony to that. And uh, there were 5 million Ukrainians who died fighting Germany, trying to keep them out of their land and preserve their freedom. What freedom, a little bit of freedom they had from the communists or the socialists. Um, and then they turned around and killed 1.3 million Jews it's something to go down and to see the mass grave where it was, which I stood there. So it's, it's a saddening thing to be able to see their, their kind of mentality, all the Jews that they, they've killed. But then when that war was over with and you had the Russian communists began to con, con think up in their mind the Soviet Union, and in the, late, in the 50s and 60s, they soon began to get more and more countries, Poland, Ukraine, all of those countries became a part of the Soviet Union. And things began to go fairly well there, at least as long as you were, uh, showed your support of the party. If you didn't show your support, you were in trouble. For instance, if you were a Christian and you were raising your children at that time, if you would uh, support the people of the Soviet Union, you had to wear a red scarf around your neck, and that red scarf said, hey, we... We may go to church or whatever or whoever we are, we support, we support the Soviet Union. And if you were a Christian and you didn't put on that red scarf on your kids, your kids could go no further than what we call high school. At the end of high school, they either had to go to work wherever they sent them. Most of the guys were sent into the military. Uh, one of my friends who went to be Lord this, this year who was in, uh, whose family refused uh, to acknowledge the Soviet Union, refused to wear the red scarves, was sent immediately into the Air Force there and then transferred to Siberia where he served for a long time in the Air Force. Um, and it was, but it was still pretty good as long as you towed the line and did what you were told to do. There was some food to eat and other things. But in 1991, when the Soviet 
Union dissolved, so to speak, and they backed out of Ukraine. They took everything with them that they felt like they had done, which meant all the equipment and any medicines. Uh, they took food with them. I mean, it was just bizarre how devastated they had kind of left that country. Uh, people living in apartments noticed that they had used inferior concrete, and so some of the places were falling apart, literally crumbling. Uh, and so North Carolina Baptist here in, in around 1994, 95, became partners with Ukraine. They, they wanted to help as Christians, help this nation, help the Christians there try to recover from that. And in 1995, uh, there was a group uh, that gathered uh, for an orientation that most of us didn't know each other. I happened to be one of those. I was pastoring in Durham at that time. And we gathered around for orientation, and it began to tell us about the devastation that was going on there due to the political uh, kind of things that were happening in Ukraine. And they told us that we had to take our own water with us, our own food. We took all of that for 14 days to make sure that you took anything that you thought of value, and we wanted to take as much medicine as we could because they had no medicine. And so we uh, all gathered from age 80, Aunt Jane, she was 80, she was going, and uh, godly lady, man, all the way down to me. I think I was the youngest, I was 40 or 41 at that particular time. I'll claim 40, it makes me a little bit younger. Uh, as it is. But we went over there at the airport, uh, some American Christians. We were just pumped up, ready to rock and roll, man. And we rolled into LaGuardia up there, and it was, it was a nightmare going through security with all those big, that we'd already gone through with the big boxes, had to do that all over again for some reason. And the end result was there was a tremendous delay. The plane was delayed. Is everything was going nuts and we'd be standing around for a long time. And one of the people on the team was a pastor. He was an older pastor. He's probably about 15 years older than me or whatever. And he just lost it. He blew a fuse. I mean, he turned red face. He was just, I'm going home and I'm going home right now. And he came to the lady who was over and he says, I want, I want a ticket now to get back home. And if you don't give me a ticket, I want you to get me a car now. I'm driving back home. And and so she looked around the room, and I, I tried to not look at them. I was just, you, know, you ever been there? You was like, I'm not looking nothing, you know. I knew kind of what was fixing to happen. And she came over, and she said, how about going down to calm, calm him down? You're the only other pastor on, on the team. I'm going, why me? Because that man is mad, man. But I remember going over there, and he was just complaining. It was just one thing after another after another. But we, he was a good guy. He really did. He loved the Lord. And, and finally, we got calmed down. We got on the plane. And I kept telling him, I said, if things will be good, and ain't Jane, she's going around to everybody, God's going to use you. God's going to use you. She's just encouraging everybody. 80 years old, she's just Cadillacing through there. We get up in the air, we end up having to go to Iceland. Not a stop we wanted to make. We're in the airport a little bit, people start complaining. Now we're going to be late getting there. This is what it was. But ain't Jane, she said, the Lord work it all out. We left and went to Poland, got to Poland. There was a little crisis going on, so the military surrounded us. And they are walking with us with weapons to the plane. And everybody's complaining. They said, are we going to get blown up? You know, is this what we signed up for? You know, it's just kind of like that. Finally ended up in Lviv. We spent the night there. Um, and there's no air conditioner. Can you imagine that? No air conditioner at all. I mean, they didn't know what that was. It was 95, 96 degrees. Humidity was very high. And when we went to sleep that night, you were sweating profusely. I've never seen a pig sweat, but somebody said, I'm sweating like a hog. I thought, okay, well, maybe, the, maybe they do sweat. I don't know. But anyway, you couldn't sleep. You know why? Mosquitoes. I'm talking about you never heard the like a slapping going on in your life. And I, I really, one time I thought, I don't want to go to sleep because I might wake up and be somebody's dessert because this is going on. But when we woke up, seriously, my pillow was completely black with killed mosquitoes. I'd killed during the night. It looked like the outline where my head was like an outline of a murder victim. And this was everybody. And everybody's, and you know, here's, here's the old preacher brother. He says, we're all going to get my malaria out of this. What a trip. Malaria, we'll go home, we'll die. I mean, it's just, it was just this kind of thing. 
They loaded us up. They took us to about 45 minutes away where we were going to spend the rest of our time. And they get, sat us in rooms, and we met the families we we're going to live with. I happened to be uh, with a brother in the Lord, and we went in this home that was unbelievers. And uh, he had everything, though, because he had been overseer of a collective of a group of farms. And because he did that, they allowed him to have a lot of stuff. So he had a nicer house than I, I could ever have. And he had everything you could imagine. Matter of fact, he wanted me to see all the beer and wine and liquor he had in here. Nobody else had it, you know, uh, which is a whole nother story, and I'll tell it sometime. But he, he, it was there. But when we got ourselves together and began to minister in the thing, we went out in the different villages and just never seen that kind of poverty. It was amazing me to talk to the believers there. Went in one little lady's house, and she had maybe two chairs in the whole house. Slept on top of a wood heater with quilts piled up on top of it. It was insulated with ceramic. That was her bed. And she was telling us about how her husband, who had been a Christian, had been removed and baptized till he died in the river. She introduced us to some others, asked me to have a Bible study. I did, but others were telling about grandpas and daddies and brothers who disappeared because they were Christians and didn't go along with this. I, I looked one time from my room and I watched, uh, we talk about lines. You know, people say, I went, to the, I went up there to TJ Maxx and there was a line. As all, I was up there, at, you know, sports authority and a line all went around the building, you know. I watched people stand in line starting at 4 o'clock in the morning with a cup about this big to get one cup of milk. They stood in there from sometimes four hours to get one cup of milk. And we were eating out of our, our boxes. We began to, I heard complaints. Now if I eat one more chip, if I have to have, say, one more cheese cracker, if I have to, I mean, I, I'm getting so tired of this. And... They were just, it was just one thing after another. It really was. The main drink that we could drink there was a compote. It was made out of cherries. And so people were substituting that, not thinking what that would cause. And they were drinking quarts of cherry juice. Now put that, your mind around it. And then the result was that if you didn't have your roll with you, there was none there. None. I'm talking about None. So it was a very trying time, and it got so trying that toward the end of the week of our time there, they called a meeting in the church, and all of us, the Americans, were in there, and the pastor there got up with his interpreter with tears in his eyes, and he says, I don't know how to please y'all. I've done everything that's been asked of me, but nobody seems to be. We're late. We tell you come at 8, and we don't come to 8.30. But you must understand, we don't have schedule like you schedule on time. If I say 8 and I'm there by 9, I'm on time. It wasn't for us. Because I can tell you how many times people say, I'd get a call where I was and they'd say, it's, eight, it's 5 after 8, where are they at? I said, well, I don't know. But they'll be here. And, and it was just a terrible time. I mean, what's this guy? He was just torn up because of the grumbling, the complaining. And so... I just was convicted by that. I just thought, wow, you know, that's tough. And I just stood up and I said, I'm, I apologize to you, but I didn't come here for the agenda. I just want to help you the way I can. And one after another, everybody else did too. And we began to share this. And thus began a good partnership. We left out of there. And as we were on the plane, somebody from Ukraine came up to us and said, we really thank you for coming. And you'll really like Poland because they got ice. See, we hadn't had ice. Do you know how many complaints that I heard about no ice? They don't even have any ice in this place. I don't even know if they got a refrigerator, you know. So we got to Poland, and people got their ice. We were met by seminary students who, at the seminary there, and they gave us ice drinks, and everybody was going like, man, this is what I'm talking about, ice drinks. All of a sudden, we went from grumbling and griping to, hey, man, I got ice I got a hot shower in there, man. That's what I got. I got it. We were back. Why? Because it was a lot like what we knew here. But when I came at that moment, and even to this day, it started then, but even to this day, uh, I realized that there's some people out there that are like thermometers. You know what I'm saying? 
they register what's going on. They register what's happening to them. They, are, they can give you the temperature in the room in the circumstance. If the situation is tight, if it's stressful, they'll register tension and anxiety and irritability. If it's a stormy situation, then you can look over there and you can see it on their face, the worry and the fear that's coming off of them. If it's calm and everything's going the way that they expect it to go, they look just so relaxed and so peaceful. So I, I've discovered then, and I, I know it even more so today. I've seen it, you know, in recent days that people are thermometers, but there's others who are thermostats. The thermostats, they regulate the atmosphere where they are. In other words, they're change agents. That's who they are. They never let a situation dictate to them their mood, their attitude. They determine what that is in Christ. They're, thermo they're not thermometers, they're thermostats. So at some point in every one of our lives, we have to ask ourselves, is contentment created and coming from inside of us, or is it a result of how things are going or not going outside of us? You see, because ultimately, just like we who went to a country that had been wrecked by socialism and communism and all these other things, we complained because we had it made here pretty much. And even today, there's a lot of us who are discontented because we've watched one too many news shot or listened to one too many uh, podcasts or read too many articles and our, our whole life seems to be in a wad. How are things going? Hmm, does that really matter that much? I want to look at Philippians 4 because that whole chapter in Philippians, <coughs> excuse me, is about contentment. It's about thankfulness. And I think we could really use a shot of this even today. And I want to begin reading verse 10 through verse 12. This is the Word of God, and this is what it says. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were not indeed, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to, be ab how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger uh, and abundance and need. Now, you have to understand, Paul wrote this in prison. And uh, this guy shows up named Epaphroditus bringing a money gift from the Philippians. And, and Paul starts out and says, Man, I rejoice in the Lord that you've revived your concern for me. And the word revive has to do with like a flower, a perennial flower that blooms at just the right time. Uh, and he said, man, you, you've, you've brought back, not that you didn't have concern, you just didn't have an opportunity, is what he says. But he says that he, he uses a word there, he says, I have learned, for I have learned in whatever situation. That word learn there means to learn uh, from experience. It's a context of learning, that commitment is not something that he, he may immediately had after he was saved, but he learned it through all of his experiences that he's gone through, both the easy things and the difficult situations, and, and it brought him to the point of learning the one true source of joy, and, and he knew that. So it's a learning. I learned from what I've gone through in my life. And he says, uh, there I've learned how to be content is what it is. And so contentment doesn't talk about uh, contentment being based on something that's going on out here. He's talking about the word actually means contained. So it's like it's inside of me. His, his word when he says I have no content means that it's a, it's a person who, who has the resources within them uh, so that they don't have to depend on what's going on outside of them or what the latest service is. It's inside of them. And this is the terms that he uses. And so if you and I are going to learn the, and, and how to be content and thankful, there's several things that we need to know. And I'll be honest with you, we need to know these things now. We need to remember them. 
because of all the actions. I mean, some I, I've heard them. People have said, man, you know, I'm just anxious inside. I don't know what's going to happen or whatever. And, and I told them, I said, well, you know, nothing that's going on right now, uh, this is not the first time any of this has happened. It's been happening. It's been stuff like this has been happening for a long time. Well, why are we? Why are we not? Uh, why, why are we like we are? I said because we're looking at how's this going to affect me? How's it going to affect my bank account? How's it going to affect my job status? This is a more personal. We're looking at it from my my view, not in the overall view. And so what I want to do is talk about contentment and thankfulness, because you need to remember some things. You need to know some things you need to focus on things the first thing you've got to remember folks is something that i've said over and over again i may say it again next week i may say it the next week i may say it the next week until you're seeing it in your sleep and then we got it right and this is this you've got to remember that god is in control he is in control of this thing isaiah 46 verses 8 through 11 is a clear passage where God reminds Isaiah, he's upset because the Babylonians are coming and taking over, and it looks like it's going to be the end of them, and, and he doesn't understand everything. Where are you at, God? Why are you letting this happen? And God speaks up and reminds him of who he is, and as he does so, he reminds us, and this is what he says. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. He says, you've got to call this in mind. You've gone away from me. Well, then do your own thing. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things not yet come. In other words, I can tell you what's happening in the future. And he says, say, my counsel, God says, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, that's Babylon, the man of my counsel from a far country, Nebuchadnezzar, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass, I have purposed and I will do it. God says, I'm in charge of everything. I'm in control of this thing. But, but it, Paul echoes that same thing in Romans, right? If you look at Romans 8, 31 and 32, what's Paul say? He says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's just stop right there. If God is for us, who can be against us? I would love for some Christian to tell me that if you're in Christ and God is for you, who, who, who can be against you? Who can be against you? Who can condemn you? You see, that's, that, that's the key. And then he goes on and he says, he who did not spare his own son, Jesus, but gave him up for us all on the cross, how will he not also with him, Jesus, graciously give us all things? Right? And then he goes down in verse 35 and 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, Danger, sword, no, in all these things, look at this, in all these things, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, Jesus, who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God says, you better remember who I am. And so out of that, Paul says in Philippians 4.10, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord uh, greatly that now at length you have revi revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Believe it or not, this is him beginning to acknowledge that Hey, I, I remember God. He's got this, right? What do you mean? Well, God's in control. This is the thing you've got to know. Nothing will ever enter your life or my life as a believer that God does not either decree or allow. You're not caught by off guard by nothing coming in your life. And nothing will ever enter your life 
if you're willing to trust him that he can't work out for good. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it can be tragic, but God can work it out for good. And that's what it means that he is sovereign, that he is in control. He is before all things. He created all things. He holds all things together. He is above all things. He knows all things. He accomplishes all things. He rules over all things. He is in control of all things. Now, that's... You, you can't find an area that he's not in control of. He's not just another ism. Not just another ism, some religion out there that claims to be equal with Christianity. That's not true. God is immeasurable. God is eternal over all and worthy over all to receive from you and me as believers praise and adoration and thanks. He is sovereign. Now, Paul, who is a missionary, an apostle, a church planner, he's the one who planted the church or founded the church at Philippi. He, he had a love bond with them, but he hadn't had any support from them uh, in 10 years uh, as the, founding, uh, the founder of the church. But that was all right with Paul. That was all right with him. He understood that. And he says, I know it wasn't. He says to the church, I know it wasn't because you weren't concerned it was because you lacked what? He said, an opportunity. You didn't have an opportunity. You, did, you just didn't have an opportunity. And the word opportunity comes from a root Greek word, kairos, which, which means right time or right season. He says, you never had a right time or right opportunity. He's not talking about chronological time. So there is a season. He knew it was in God's hands. And if God gave a proper season, a proper time and a proper opportunity, then those things would find their way to come to life. That's what Paul believed. That just because I may think that they should have or could have doesn't mean they would, they would have if that God had given a chance. Now God's given them an opportunity. And so there was no panic in uh, heart here, the heart of Paul. There was no need to manipulate people with sad stories and other things to try to get them to give him money. The, the reason this man, Paul, was content within himself was because he knew, listen, he knew that the times and the seasons and the opportunities of life were controlled by a sovereign God. He knew that. He knew that. And until you and I learn that, we will never know uh, and never experience contentment uh, until you come to the place in your life where you understand that God is in control. He is sovereign, and he is ordering everything to his holy purpose, his own holy purpose. This is his story, his story. You will never know what true contentment is. So you've got to remember that God is in control. I don't care what's going on. I don't care how out of control it may be. Well, why did this happen? Trust God. He is in control. He is sovereign. Secondly, uh, I think you'll learn from Paul is that we trust God in Christ, whatever may come our way, uh, that, uh, that we need to allow him in Christ through the Holy Spirit to provide our needs. In other words, we trust God in Christ and allow him to meet our needs. Listen carefully, needs. Philippians 4, 6, look there. Paul says this, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication or petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Then he looks down at verse 13 of Philippians 4, and he says this, I am enabled to do all things in him, Jesus, who continually strengthens me. I am enabled to do all things in him, Christ, who, Jesus, continually strengthens me. Then he goes down six verses, 19. He says this, And my God shall supply all every need, all your need, every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You see, at that point, Paul is echoing the truth of Jesus Christ. 
You see, Paul's not just coming up with this. He's just preaching what Jesus preached. Matthew 6, verse 25. Jesus said this. So I tell you, you all, don't worry about everyday life. Hmm? Don't worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food, drink, and clothes. Doesn't life consist of more than food and clothing? And then he goes on in verse 32 and 33 of that same chapter, and he says, why be like the pagans, the unbelievers, who are so deeply concerned about these things? That's their big concern. Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Stop right there. You hear me? Right this second, God the Father knows every need you have. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, God knows what you need better than you do. And he says, he, he says my Father already knows your needs, and he will give you all you need from day to day. Notice this. He's not going to give you next month. He's going to give you today, right? He says, if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. He says, he's going to take care of you if you're seeking after him every single day first and his kingdom. Comes with a little bit of a conditional. It's a conditional at this point. It's not that he don't love you. But if you're going to say, I know Jesus, and you're going to live your life and do your own thing, and regardless of what he does, you can't expect him to meet your need. He'll say, okay, you're so good at meeting your need. Go ahead and meet it. And that's why there's so many miserable people. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, we're so busy meeting our own need and taking care of our own business, we just keep getting ourselves deeper in it, you know? But it is. It's not, and here's the truth of what Jesus is saying. God will not necessarily give us what we want. You understand what I'm saying? He may not. He will always, always provide for the needs of his children. But he may not give us always what we want. And what he wants us to do is to remember that he is willing to provide for our needs and to begin to know that because of who God is and his desire to provide for us as his children, that they will flow out of that from depths of our soul a sense of thanksgiving, of gratitude, in response to who he is in our life. That it won't be just words, it'll be deep down flowing up and out of us gratitude. Now, if you think back, the Israelites were out in the wilderness and they were whining and complaining. I'm talking about a million people whining and complaining. I almost picture them like my kids were when they were very small and they wanted something in the store and they wouldn't get it, so they'd lay down on the floor and, I never get anything I want. I'd just step over them like, whose kid is that? <laughs> I think both of them's got a complex because of it, you know? But, but well, that sounds like a, a America, don't it? A million people whining and complaining. Hmm, little parallel there. But they're whining and complaining. Why? They didn't have any food. So what did God do? Well, God gave them quail. Quail, that was, that was their chicken, okay? We eat chicken, theirs was quail, and it was good, and, and I like it today. And manna, quail and manna, that's what they had. Manna, you remember when they got it, they went out and they saw manna in Hebrew, they said, manna, what's that mean? It means, what is it? Uh, that's what manna means, the word, what is it? They went out and they saw this substance, what is it? Manna, manna was this substance that tasted like a wafer that's been glazed with honey. That's almost like a Krispy Kreme, ain't it? <laughs> I just now thought of that. Great, day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But listen to me. God gave it to them every day. And on the sixth day, he gave them enough they could gather that would get them through the seventh so they didn't have to go out looking for it. And they always had what they needed. Hear me? And it was abundant. Manna. Now, how many of you have ever seen the movie Forrest Gump? Anybody, anybody ever watched Forrest Gump? Some of you. Have you ever watched it 12 times? Some of you? Yeah, some of you are honest. You remember when he was talking to his friend Bubba, 
the shrimp guy, and they were talking about shrimp. Let me, let me give you what I wrote. This, this, is, this is the dialogue. Listen to this. It's pretty good. Anyway, Bubba says, like I was saying, shrimp is the fruit of the sea. You can barbecue it, boil it, broil it, bake it, saute it. There's a shrimp kebab, shrimp creole, shrimp gumbo, pan fried, deep fried, stir fried. There's pineapple shrimp, lemon shrimp, coconut shrimp, pepper shrimp, shrimp soup, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger, shrimp sandwich. Uh, that's about it. I love that dialogue because why? That's, this same thing applies in Exodus 16. It could be said to the Israelites, they wanted food. He gave them manna, and they had it to the abundance. And, and I can almost say, and God said, well, you can take it any way you want it. You can bake it. You can have baked manna. You can have broiled manna. You can have barbecue manna. You can have manna on a stick. You can, you can have manna burgers, manna salad, manna cotti. Sorry. <laughs> you could have manna, <laughs> manna cream pie. You get my drift, right? I mean, you, you can have, you, you can have it any way, right? But it's manna. They had everything they needed. How many of you know God would never give them something that wasn't nutritious enough for their body, right? And so they had manna, but they still complained. The same thing applies there. But here's the theological truth of that, a biblical truth. Because God loves you and me, he doesn't always give us what we want. He really doesn't. He always gives us what we need. What we need. Like, I, I think God shows this, uh, a, parent, a parental side here that's really good. Because God knows that giving children what they want always isn't necessarily good for them. It's just not. In fact, one of the best ways to create a grumbling, complaining, discontented adult is for a parent to give that child whatever they want when they want it. You end up with breaking out windows or grown people in their 30s on the ground kicking and screaming and saying, but I want this, right? You see, you've never seen that. I'm, I'm going to pull my camera out and start taking pictures. Done made my mind up. So you, you, what I'm saying is, folks, is you got to trust God and allow him to provide for your needs. You see? What disturbed us in the Ukraine was not that we didn't have what we needed to do ministry and to survive. What it was was our comfort was disturbed. We didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have ice. I mean, if you didn't bring a roll of toilet paper, you was in bad shape. I mean, it's just that kind of thing. We didn't get to take a bath often. And if it was, it was cold. Why would we want to take a cold bath? You see, this is kind of how it was for them. And so you've got to trust Christ and allow him to meet for your needs. But then thirdly, you've got to focus your life. You've got to be focused in your life and, and, and become a Christ-filled, spirit-filled thermostat. In other words, you're not being dictated and just showing what's going on around us, the temperature. You are showing and a change agent how Christ in you can make a difference. And so you focus your life, first of all, in prayer. Look at Philippians 6, 4, 6, and 7. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be, known, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He says, In everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, in everything stands in contrast to what? Don't be anxious about anything. In everything, don't be anxious about anything. And in, in that word, in everything, means in every detail, in every circumstance of your life, in situations where other people are frustrated or fretting or worrying, believers who are in Christ, in the Lord, it, they don't do that. They submit their case, their circumstances, whatever it is going on in their life, they submit that to God in Christ in prayer accompanied by thanksgiving. That, that's what real believers do. I mean, especially, especially striking, I think, in this is he says with thanksgiving. You know what I'm saying? He says with thanksgiving. Um, and, and it shouldn't be surprising, really. I don't think it was surprising would be surprising to all Paul because his own life 
was, was saturated really with thanksgiving. And, and, and he, if you study his letters in the New Testament, he couldn't imagine a, a real believer, a Christian life that was not a constant outpouring of thanksgiving and gratitude to God. He just couldn't do it. I mean, you read through it and see what I'm saying. But matter of fact, he stated back in Romans 1, 21, that a lack of thanksgiving, a lack of gratitude will, uh, will leads to idolatry, chasing after something else to, to help you get through life. He said this, they knew God, but they did not give glory to God or thank him. Their thinking became useless. Their foolish minds were filled with darkness. You see, if you know God, but you refuse to acknowledge him and thank him, you're taking steps away from God by depending on other things, your resources or whatever, and you're pushing out the light. You're putting the basket on top of the light. Remember, Jesus said, don't hide your, you don't hide your light. We start hiding our light. That's what he's saying. You see, thanksgiving is this explicit acknowledgement that God is the creator and we are his creatures. We are his, we're his creation. And thus we are dependent upon him. And that's what thanksgiving is. It's acknowledging him and who he is and who we are. And it's a recognition in that case that everything is a gift from him to us and that you and I uh, are just voicing to him in our thanks uh, how much we appreciate God and his goodness and his generosity. You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's flowing out of our recognition that all good things, right? He says he gives us all good things to what? Enjoy. That's what, what the Bible says. He gives us all things to enjoy. And so if a prayer as a supplication for one's own self or petition indicates it what it does is it indicates our total trust and uh dependence on him uh and and when we accompany that with thanksgiving when we do that uh it puts both prayer and our lives in the proper truth of what god wants for us what that our prayers are not just prayers we're speaking because that's what we're supposed to do as christians that our thanksgiving is not just because we need to be say thanks what it's flowing out from who we know god we remember who he is we know he's meeting our needs we know that he will take care of us and out of that our thanksgiving flows out of us and we can't help but do that and so we focus on that and thanksgiving let me say this does not just mean saying thank you in advance of gifts that you've asked him to give you and you hope to receive it's really the posture of your life it's the posture of your life as a believer uh, as you're positioning yourself for well, god this is my father he loves me he's taking care of me no matter what's happening outside he's with me he'll never leave me and so we began to acknowledge god and that gratitude flows up in us and you know how it issues out generosity we become generous because God is generous to us and always does. But you don't just focus on prayer. You begin uh, to focus uh, not only on, on prayer, but you focus as well your, in your thought life, in your reflection. Philippians 4.8, he says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now that word think there in the Greek speaks of careful reflection. In other words, I'm carefully and, and deliberately reflecting on these things, things that are true and honorable and, and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent, worthy of praise. I'm, I'm focused on those things. So what he's doing here is getting us in the right perspective. Let me tell you what I mean. You and I, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've been washed in his blood, your home and citizenship is in heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. And as believers, we're admonished quite a bit to begin to think of the future. 
Let that be our hope, our future. And we're thinking about that in the future. God, I know it's a mess right now. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We might be out of the job and blah, blah, blah. But I know I've got a home in heaven. And that's good and that's true. But what Paul is here saying is, but you're not in heaven yet. You know what I'm saying? He's saying to you and me, you're not in heaven yet. You're citizens of heaven. But you're living life on a planet that is broken. And this is what he's saying in there. He's trying to ground us where we are. He says, man, you've got to carry out your lives now in the present in this world. And so as you do, it's very easy to do what? Notice the mess, the heartache, and look only at the tragedy, what didn't have go the way I wanted it to, what I lost, what I... We look at all these things. And he said, man, get in this life and begin to look and consider and reflect on what is good and what is excellent that you see rather than the misery and anxiety producing bad, evil, and tragic stuff. It's to be able at that point to ground ourselves. Yes, we got a home in heaven, but by George's, I'm living right now in this life, and there's some good here no matter what the devil tries to do. Do you remember, this is the thing I love about Jesus, and it's the thing I've prayed more for in my own life and it has been both a strength and a weakness in my life. Be honest with you, as a, as a pastor, as a leader, it's been both a strength and a, and a weakness, uh, and sometimes more of a weakness than it needs to be. But here's his. You ever notice how Jesus, Peter comes up, he's, he's Simon, he's off the wall man, you know, wild man, and he looks at me and says, your name is Peter. Little stone. He says, and I'm going to build my church on the kind of faith you got. And Peter became a great leader in the church. What, what happened? Jesus saw in Peter what nobody else could see. There's this unique kind of thing that Jesus always sees what others can't see in me and you. They see us as a loser. They see us as somebody who's not worth putting time in, somebody who's done something that can never be forgiven. But God looks at him and says, if you're willing to turn away from your sin and come to me, I'm going to show you what real life can look like. He sees the best in us. And so if you and I are in Christ, guess what? Even in a world that's as squirrely as it's getting, you can still see good. You can still see excellent things. You can still see God's hand move. You can still see his handiwork. You can still recognize, and instead of reflecting on all the junk and filling your head full of all the negativity and finding you pit to your stomach, and you do these things where you're battling in your mind. You know that? You're carrying on conversation. You know somebody over here that believes this, and you believe this, and you're, you're doing I'm getting my mind. And you, you waste a solid hour, and you're worked up, mad, and everything else, and you ain't even talking to nobody yet. We waste time. Listen, folks, just be sensitive to the Spirit of God. Understand there's more good to consider than there are evil. Why? Because God is in you. And because God is in you, listen to me, we win. We will never be defeated. I don't care if the devil himself is sitting on the throne. You understand what I'm saying? He is not greater than God. You and I have much more to be thankful for. And so we need to be able to do that, to reflect. The psalmist says in Psalm 103, 2, he says, Praise the Lord on my soul and forget not all of his benefits. We need to remind ourselves on a daily basis of the benefits of being in Christ and knowing him and let our life go forward. I, I, a contented life, folks, this contented life here in, in, in this passage is a Christ-filled life, a spirit-filled life, and therefore, because it is Christ-filled and spirit-filled, it is a life of thankfulness. It cannot help but issue if you're walking on a daily basis with the Lord. I'm telling you, you say, well, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. There's nothing easy. I'm, I'm, I'm scared of anybody who makes it sound like it's easy. It's hard. But everything in your life is hard. You just have to make up your mind who you're going to believe and who you're not. If you believe what I'm saying here is the gospel truth, 
and you begin to look to your Savior who died for you and gave you and depend on, it doesn't mean everything's going to go good around you. It might get worse. But here's the thing. You know he's working to bring about good. Let me give you an example of this right here. There's a missionary explorer guy that lived back in 1840. He died in 1873. His name was David Livingston. And David was serving in Africa during that particular time, 1840 to 1873. And there was something that happened in his life that gets the point across what I'm trying to make. He was very eager, David was very eager to be able to travel into the uncharted lands of Central Africa. He was just in Christ. He was ready to go. Uh, he wanted to go in there to preach the gospel. Uh, and so he, he uh, on one occasion, he traveled to the very edge of a large territory that was in Central Africa, but it was controlled by a very powerful tribal chief. Now, according to the tradition of the, of the African people in Central Africa, the chief would come out to meet the person who was at the edge there where they were, and he would exchange, he would get to look at everything that person had, choose something that caught his fancy or whatever, and then he would give them a gift and said. So he comes out to meet uh, Livingston, and Livingston comes forward and uh, he puts out all of his stuff. He puts his personal property out. He, he, he's going to do this, and then he knows that uh, uh, the chief will give him something in return. So he didn't have a whole lot of possessions with him. So he, he, he really wanted to do this. He laid out on the ground. He laid out all his clothes, his books, his watch, and even his goat. Now listen to me. He suffered from chronic stomach pain. He, he couldn't, he, he needed goat's milk. It was the only thing that would work for him was goat's milk. And so he prized this goat and he brought the goat out. Well, the chief goes over, he's looking at everything, and guess what? He took the goat. He took the goat. And so Livingston's looking at him, he says, uh-oh. And then the chief comes to him and he returns and gives him a carved stick shaped like a walking stick. Now, Livingston was a little ticked. He was more disappointed than anything. He's looking at this carved walking stick, ugly-looking thing, and he began to complain and gripe to God. <laughs> Why this stupid walking stick? That's what he called it, stupid. He took my goat. He got a, I got a, yes, that's where it came from. He got my goat. You got it. <laughs> I knew he was going to catch on to it, but he did. But he said, all I got is this stinking stick. It, what is it? What can it do for me? I needed the goat to keep me well. And one of the people who was translating for him came to him and explained, uh, Sir Livingston, that is not a walking stick. Huh? No, it's not a walking stick. It's the king's very own scepter. And with it, you will be able to get into every village in our country with no hassle because you have his scepter. The king, you see, sir, was, has greatly honored you. Livingston was speechless, but he, was, he, knew, he found he was right because God opened up all of Central Africa with him with that crooked walking stick. And after that came evangelist after evangelist after evangelist. And literally tens of thousands of Central Africans came to know Christ. You see, sometimes in our disappointment over what we don't have, we fail to appreciate the significance of what we do. And some of us right now, we're some more concerned about what, well, I can't believe our selection went on. It, it, you know, I feel like I've been given a bag of poo. You know what I'm saying? Well, maybe, just maybe, God will use that bag of poo that's stinking up your life and turn it into something great. You see, I'm convinced that God's not put off by anything that we think's gone screwy here in America. I believe he may be setting up for the greatest spiritual awakening this country's ever seen. And it might be coming because of everything that we're thinking about shouldn't have happened. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not here prophesying, so don't put me on YouTube. Pastor Katab Heights prophesies. No, I'm just telling you 
What I know to be true in Livingston's life is true in every one of our lives. Sometimes things don't go. and We're not content. We're not thankful because it shouldn't have went that way. It should be this way. But just maybe God's giving you the key to revival in your own family, the key to something going on in your family that you don't even experience, but you're too busy complaining and getting all about yourself rather than others, right? So let me say it again. Sometimes in our disappointment of what we don't have, we fail to appreciate the significance of what we do have in Christ. If you're listening to me or you're under the sound of my voice and you've never trusted Jesus, I'm telling you whether you believe in God or believe in the afterlife, there is a God and his name is Yahweh. He is the one and only God. There's no other God but him. And there is an afterlife and it exists in two places and without Jesus Christ, you won't be in the one. And if you've never trusted Christ, he wishes that none should die without Christ and go to that other place we know as hell, but he wishes that all should come to know him. And if you've never trusted him, you're doing life on your own, and all I can say is good luck. Good luck. If you've never trusted Christ, the Bible just tells you, man, you call upon his name, you'll be saved. Acknowledge, you can't save yourself, ain't nobody. I, I think none of us good enough to get in the presence of a holy God. None of us. If you go by what we've done and what we think, what if we could get in our head and it was real what all we thought? Good grief, there wouldn't be one of us worthy of nothing. But you come to know Christ. Some of you who are believers, you're not living like a believer. You're not thinking like a believer. You're not talking like a believer. You're not thinking like a believer. You're just living life, and this is just what? It's something we do. It's a religious thing. It looks good, but it's not coming from deep within. Believer, listen to me. You and I have got much more to be thankful for in Jesus Christ than we do to complain about. And he will never let you alone. He'll get care of every need. I stood back here just a little bit ago and just shared just a little bit of all my family's gone through. Did we like it? No, no, no. But I can't go back for one second and say it. My needs, my family's needs have never been met. God's been faithful. I think we need to get back where, as Jesus said, seek me first. Let me be the first priority you have. Let my kingdom be the first priority, and then I'll add some things that you need. Because Jesus is coming back. You think he's coming back now? He said he could come at any moment. He said that. And you know what he said? Don't worry about when it is. Just worry if you're ready. Right? Just worry if you're ready. And this is the case. As a believer, I'm just saying to you and challenging you to turn away from the unthankfulness, the mouthing of words that don't come from a heart that's full of thankfulness and make a new commitment, fresh commitment to Christ today. Say, God, use me. Let it be so evident in my life that I can touch the lives of someone else. That I can touch someone else for Christ. Let my words be thankfulness, full of gratitude because you love me take care of me he will he does and he will right now would you bow with me would you stand as we pray father in Jesus name thank you for putting this on my heart God I just praise you for it I really do and I thank you for your love and your grace <clears throat> I pray God that right now I know there's some I don't know if they're in this room or just Watching my life, I don't know. There's some that just don't know you as Savior, Lord. They just don't. But I'm praying that right now they would see that they've never been loved like you love them. They've never been in a place where they've had the Creator God love them enough to, to say, man, I gave my son for you, and if you'll trust him, I'll forgive you of all your sins and begin to make you like my son. You'll be able to come into my presence for all eternity. No more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. But 
you've got to turn away. You've got to acknowledge who you are. You see, that's the problem. We're too busy pointing out other people's sin and not our own. You've got to turn away from it. Just come to him and acknowledge him. Just tell him, Jesus, right this moment, I realize I can't save myself. And so I'm trusting you, Jesus, what you did on the cross. I, I, I may not can explain it all right now, but I'm believing that you died for me, was buried, and was rose from the dead. And God, I'm asking you to forgive me of all my sins. Just clean me up inside out that I may be your child in this day, that heaven is my home. Help me to know that today. I'm giving you my life, trusting you, Jesus. Let that issue forth in thanksgiving. Begin to thank him. Thank him, man. If your gratitude is there, let others know. Man, I'm so thankful to God because today I'm trusting Christ. Don't go by whether you're hearing thunder or seeing lightning. It's a matter of the will. I choose this day, Jesus. But Father, I'm praying for my brothers and sisters here. You know who, who we are. You know whether some of us, as Romans 1 said, have started walking after and chasing after other things and we're kind of putting our, our, our lamp under a bushel and hiding it from the world. I pray that you'd help us right now just kick it off. I pray right now, God, that you'd become first priority in our lives again as believers, first priority in our family life, and that your kingdom would be what we seek after. And, God, that we would uh, show forth our thankfulness to you uh, and let it flow outward to others. Father, help us do that, please. And as we pray, we pray, dear God, you're a God of healing. We pray for the Stokes family and the passing of Earl. We pray tomorrow as we gather at that graveside that, God, you'd comfort that family who's already known uh, the tragedy of losing their daughter. I pray, dear God, that you'll surround them with your love and your comfort and, ha and, and be thankful unto you, dear God, because Earl knew you. He's at home. He's at home. I thank you for the good news that Daryl Nolan, dear God, had and that his bops had come back negative, that we prayed for him on Wednesday, and there it is. And God, he can go ahead and have his kidney surgery. And I just pray, God, you surround him and his wife, uh, his family with your love and your grace. We'll praise you for it. We pray for Brooke Carpenter, Father. I know that for, for even Roger and Lynn. I know they're upset, but we pray for the blood clot in her leg and for those in her lungs. We pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus that you would remove those clots right now. Let them respond to medicine, and if they're not responding to medicine, just remove them because you are the God who heals. And let her be able to get out of that hospital and get on with life that's just really beginning to be what she could have really, really enjoyed. I pray that you'll be with Roger and Lynn, surround him with your love. I pray that you'll be with all of us, dear God, that we'll leave here with hearts full of gratitude because of Jesus. I commit it to you. I pray for the OCC. I pray that you'll have more and more people all week long sign up and come. And you'll, this year, those, those boxes will be extra special because they were done in a time where most people say, don't do it, but we did it and it'll change lives. I pray that it'll give you glory and honor. So we commit our day to you, we commit our service to you, and at times just ask God that you go with us and we'll give you praise and glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you folks, I love you with all my heart.